From the mid-1800s through present time, the game of baseball has weaved its way into the very fabric of our Midwestern communities. It may be just a game, but with the All-Stars coming back to Detroit, we recall shared memories that touch both the mind and the heart. Memories of All-Star games past and the emotional connection we have to this game, and in particular, to two former Tiger All-Stars. Two players whose Hall of Fame careers and legacies span back 60 years and whose love of the game and of Tiger fans will last forever. It's a special All-Star edition of the FSN Basement coming up next. Safe at third. Welcome to our historical and all-star edition of The Basement. I'm John Keating. Here in the state of Michigan, we've been attached to this game for more than a century and a half. In fact, in 1867, Detroit played host to the World's Baseball Tournament. Baseball was two words back then. And if they would have had a pre-game show, well, the host would have dressed a little something like this. Well, here at Greenfield Village, within the Henry Ford, they regularly stage baseball games from that era. Behind me, a matchup between the National Baseball Club of Parma, Michigan, against the dreaded Lottie Dawes from Waterford, Michigan. The batters were called batsmen or strikers back then. Only swings and misses counted as strikes. It was the pitcher's job to throw the ball fairly for the striker to hit it. Called strikes came later. We have strolled onto the grounds at a rather opportune time. It's 5-4 in the last of the ninth inning. And that calls to mind Detroit's first All-Star game at Briggs Stadium back in 1941. Paper, mister? Thanks, kid. Oh, hey. We weren't the first one to come up with Detroit Sports Report. In all of baseball's rich history, 1941 was truly special. It was the season of DiMaggio's hitting streak, and the last time someone hit 400. Ted Williams did it. He was hitting 405 at the break and ended up at 406. And one of his all-time favorite hits was the one that ended the All-Star game at Briggs Stadium. The American League was down 5-3 in the last of the ninth. Archie Vaughn had homered twice in the game for the National League. Joe DiMaggio had driven in a run to make it 5-4, and with two outs, up stepped Williams, who delivered a three-run homer into the right field bleachers, clapping joyously as the reports go, as the ball sailed into the upper deck and lifted the American League to a 7-5 win. It was a magical stretch for baseball in our town. In 1935 and 45, the Tigers won the world championships, beating the Cubs on each of those occasions. Then in 1946, with expectations still high for yet another title, a young man from Swifton, Arkansas joined the Tigers. George Kell had no idea that his involvement with the franchise would end some 50 years later. 20 of those summers would find him paired with a fellow Hall of Famer, and Kel and Al Kaline brought the Tigers into our homes on television. Broadcasting uh, opened a whole new avenue of life for me. I couldn't wait to get up there. And uh, my wife used to kid me, and uh, I think Carolyn too. They both went with me occasionally, but uh, they said, you can't wait to get up there and join the Tigers. You're back with your people now. And the weird thing about television is that or, or radio too, I guess, is that the folks back home, they relay it, relay it back to the player a little bit differently than you really said on the air. <laughs> and as if you're criticizing instead of just making a point that, you know, he, he, he threw the ball high, he missed a cutoff man, something like that. As we continue on a special basement from Greenfield Village, we'll look back on the rest of Detroit's All-Star history. Al Kaline played in that 71 All-Star game. He'll recall his time as a legend in Detroit. But up next, we travel to Swifton to visit with George Kell, whose drawl became forever tied to Tiger baseball. Welcome back to this special All-Star edition of the FSN Basement. 
Ten years after Detroit hosted its first All-Star game, the stage was set for some of the largest fireworks of the era. In 1951, there were six homers hit in the game at Briggs Stadium. Four by the victorious National Leaguers, Stan Musial, Bob Elliott, Gil Hodges, and Ralph Kiner, who became the only player in history to homer in three straight All-Star games. The win also included a perfect suicide squeeze bunt off the bat of Jackie Robinson, part of an 8-3 romp for the visitors. Is that a paper, mister? Hey, thanks, kid. Well, they're aggressive here in Greenfield Village. Ah, yes, we remember that George Kell homered in that game in 1951, the American League loss at Briggs Stadium. And depending on your generation, your level of knowledge about George Kell might be a little different. Some of you may be old enough to remember him as the preeminent third baseman in the American League in the 1940s and 1950s. But more of us recall him as the voice of the Tigers on television. And this is a man who knows of which he spoke. He hit better than 300 nine times, and in 1949, he won the American League batting title by a whisker. Mere percentage points over the legendary splendid splinter, Ted Williams. He was ahead five or six points going into the last week, and you don't catch Ted Williams by five or six points. But on the last day, I went in to dress, and I dressed with a side of Hoot Evers, and he said, George, I'm going to tell you something. Two for three will do it. Well, the first time up, Bob Lemon was pitching for Cleveland. They started Bob Lemon. I hit a double over third baseman's head into the left field corner. The second time up, I hit a single. Now I'm two for two. I look up in the sixth inning, fifth or sixth inning, and in from the bullpen comes Bob Feller. I thought, what in the <laughs> world is he coming in here for? He walked me. So now I'm still two for two, and um, I think I got it made. Well, in the seventh inning, he struck me out for the final out of the seventh inning. And Hoot said, you got it made. Two for three, I guarantee you got it made. Well, word came down from the press box in the ninth inning. Williams went 0 for 2, and Kells got it 1 if he don't bat again. Well, in the ninth inning, I was the fourth batter. And Red Roth sent Wakefield up to pinch hit, and he singled on the first pitch. Okay, I got my bat, and I'm ready to go. And Red said, I'm going to send up a hitter for you. And I said, no, Red. I'm not going to go in the clubhouse and sit on my stool and have everybody come by and congratulate me that I won the batting title. He said, well, I've got Ginsburg ready to hit. I said, not going to do it. And the uh, next batter went out, fly out to center field. And Eddie Lake, little shortstop, is a batter. And he hit a ground ball to Boudreaux. He fielded it about two steps in the bag, stepped on second and threw to first. I threw three bats as high as I could <laughs> I didn't want to bat, but I sure was going to bat. George Kell came to Detroit after a stretch with the Philadelphia A's. He was a Tiger from 1946 to 1952 before he was included in a monster nine-player deal with the Red Sox. Kell would go on to play for Boston and Chicago before finishing a Hall of Fame 15-year career with the Orioles. He played under some of the brightest lights in baseball. And yet George Clyde Kell was never far removed from the map spec that was and still is his hometown of Swifton. Growing up here, I had, we, it was in the Depression. I mean, my father was a barber. Lots of weeks he hardly made enough to pay the bills. He was a God-fearing man and a great ball player. And, uh, but church came first and his family and uh, my mother was the same way so I was raised in a Christian home and, uh, and knew the values in life early on and Swifton was the ideal place. Your father, George, was a big part of your baseball success. Was he your motivating factor? A good, good ball player and outstanding. He was a pitcher and played the outfield managed the home team here and had offers to go play ball, but he wouldn't leave his family. And that played a big part in my role when I quit playing at the age of 35. Well, I've got to get home to my family. Does a player always know when his day is done? When did you know it was time to go? Well, I hit 297 the last year I played. And How'd you walk away from that? I had just made up my mind that I'd been gone from home too long. I was battling two, two things that I love more than anything in the world. Baseball, but I love my home and my family and this town. 
And I just couldn't leave anymore. I'd been gone too long. I couldn't. Mr. Fetzer worked it out. I could live in Swifton, and I could broadcast Tiger baseball game on television. He just told me one time, don't you miss a game. When the FSN basement returns, George Kell speaks of a remarkable second career and his emotional Hall of Fame induction. Later, Mr. Tiger, Al Kaline, tells us of a few career highlights which might surprise you. And of course, the 71 All-Star memories still coming up. You're watching the FSN basement from the historic baseball grounds at Greenfield Village. Well, they stopped the baseball game so everybody can wave to the train that is going by us here at Greenfield Village. George Kell and Ernie Harwell, they were together in Baltimore in the late 1950s. Kell as a player, Harwell as a voice. Kell would end up in Detroit for more than three and a half decades. That story now in George Kell's inimitable draw. Mel Ott got killed in an automobile wreck. Sure. And I told my wife we were at a football game in Fayetteville. Huh? I said, we'll get a call from Mr. Fetzer. And sure enough, Monday morning, I got a call. And I said, no, I'm not interested. I just want to be at home. He, he said, you owe it to me and the Detroit people to come up here and talk to me. And I went up there and talked to him. And he did all the talking for 30 <laughs> minutes. And he was so convincing. And finally, flipped a blank contract out. And he said, George, fill it in and sign it. You owe it to us here in Detroit. What are you going to do, John? I signed it. <laughs> but I had to call my wife and tell her. She said, George, whatever best for you is best for us. For those of us who were baseball fans in Detroit, we could make the same claim. It was certainly best for us. Through the 60s, Kel had various partners. But it was when he was paired with Al Kalon that a 20-year marriage was born, though George's straightforward, folksy style never wavered. I'm proud to say uh, I, I was not a cheerleader, but in 68, I almost got caught up in it. It's <laughs> been as much a thrill for you as it is for the guy. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Mayo, good luck to you in the World Series. I want to get you away from me before I get ruined. All right, George, good luck. I love broadcasting. I couldn't wait to get to the booth. Well, this is a hitter's ballpark. It's a paradise here for hitters. The fences are not that deep. The ball carries extremely well. The pitch. There's a high fly ball, deep right. This may get up in the wind. Way back, and it is gone, a home run. You spent three and a half decades, a little more than that, tied to the city of Detroit. Tell me about your relationship with our town. Oh, I, I love Detroit. Everything good that could happen happened to me in Detroit. And I think I've told you this before. My wife said, George, God's been on your shoulder all your life. I felt that way. They made me feel that way in Detroit. While Kell spent six full seasons as a Tiger in a superb 15-year career, he realized that this place was always a little special. It's what brought him back when his second lifetime began. It was 23 years after his retirement that he learned he had won election by the Veterans Committee to the Hall of Fame. Words which had always come so easily to him suddenly didn't. I had so many people to thank. Mr. Fetzer, very much. Jim Campbell. Mr. Yawkey. I don't know. But uh, it all came from my heart and it was easy. Baseball has provided me with so much, not just financial, but the people I've met and the friends I've made. I'll tell you this story. I told it at Cooperstown, and this, this, this highlights my life about as much as anything. I told him at Cooperstown when I was inducted. My father raised three red-headed boys. Convinced that they would all be Major League ball players, if not Hall of Famers. And I said, my brother Skeeter played in the Major Leagues with the Philadelphia A's, and myself, of course, and my middle brother was killed in World War II. Or I said, who knows? My father might have been right. He might have had three Major League baseball players. And about that time, John, I was about to break down. 
I, I, I didn't know whether I'd get my breath or not. And I heard this big booming voice say, he was right. He was right. He might have had three Major League Baseball players. He did have three of them. And that just, I came to myself. I, I can finish now. If people do care, people do care. and Basement's All-Star Special resumes now from the Henry Ford and Greenfield Village's historic baseball grounds. Perhaps the greatest player in Tiger history was almost a Philadelphia athletic. Al Kaline was actually offered more money by Philadelphia to sign, but liked his chances of playing more regularly as a Tiger. You've probably heard that he never played a day in the minor leagues, going right from the Baltimore Sandlots to the major leagues. But what you might not know is that perhaps the greatest right fielder of all time had never played an inning as a right fielder prior to his arrival in Detroit. We came in late at night. We took the train. Had to came back. We came back from St. Louis. And uh, we got in 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. And we were coming straight down Michigan Avenue from the train station. And I was sitting next to Johnny Pesky. And he said, hey, kid, look out here. This is, this is going to be your home for the next couple of years. And of course, that was Briggs Stadium at the time. And of course, Tiger Stadium. And uh, the next day, I got up, had to go to a day game. They wouldn't let me in the park because I was a kid, and they, they said, what are you trying to do, sneak in the park? And I said, no, I'm the new player. So they finally called upstairs, and they said, yeah, they have a new player named Kaline. Let him in. So when I walked in, I could see the Tiger Stadium, the, the grass, and at that time, there were, the seats were all green. It was one of those great April, April mornings where the sun was just so bright. My God, that I, I was the most beautiful sight I ever saw. Everything started to come together in the middle 60s, and obviously you guys won it all in 1968. Tell me about that group. We all went to spring training in 68 with a great attitude. Uh, and you know, one of the things about the 67-68 team is that most of the players came through the minor leagues together, and they were close, and they came to the big leagues together, they struggled together, and all of a sudden they started having success together. And uh, uh, we had a team that was very close, we would do a lot of things together, and uh, we, we were able to police ourselves in the, in the locker room when we thought that maybe somebody wasn't doing what he was supposed to. Or uh, we would uh, make comments to the fact that, hey, you know, we're, we're a team. We're not, we're not about individuals. Uh, we're about winning. And, uh, and that's what happened. Do you think, when you look back on it, you retired on your own terms and at your own pace? Yeah, I, I retired when I wanted to. Uh, I remember. Uh, striking out four times in Kansas City. And I called my wife, I said, this is it. I mean, back in those days, it was an embarrassment to strike out. And I struck out four times, I never did that. And I just told my wife, I said, I'm, I'm retiring. She said, well, you know, you're not retired now, you're gonna finish the year. And of course I did and uh, got my 3,000 hit, which really was my goal. Uh, I probably could have hung on and, and maybe been a DH longer, but uh, I didn't want to just be a, an average player. I wanted to try to have my standards pretty high. You uh, took yourself out of your last game th that you played in. Tell me about that. That's Jack. the worst thing I ever did. Uh, I was very frustrated. It was, a, it was a very cold afternoon in Detroit, really cold and windy. And uh, playing against the Baltimore Orioles, and I hit a line drive to left field, and uh, I, I, just, I was just so sort of frustrated I didn't get a hit that I told Ralph Halk, I said, that's it, take me out. And not realizing that a lot of the people, even though there wasn't that many people in the stands, had really come to the ballpark to see my last sure. at bat. Had to do over again. I could have gone to the plate and gotten, made another out very easily, and, uh, and the people would have been satisfied. And yet you came within one home run of 400, three points within batting 300 for your career. Did that thought gnaw at you, perhaps, lead you to think about coming back? No, you know, back, in, back when I played, the, uh, the records did, really didn't mean that much. I knew that there, were, there have been, I think, three or four players that had 400 home runs and 3,000 hits, but they're all national. I didn't realize they were all national leaguers. Had I got one more home run, I'd been the first American sure. League players to do that. I didn't know that. 
You think you get one more home run in you if we, if we put you in a uniform, send you <laughs> back out you, there? I tell you what, it has to be about 80 mile an hour wind blowing, <laughs> a soft toss and left hander that will say, here, Al, hit it. And maybe I can get it about 300 feet. Second careers don't often come easily to pro athletes, and you'll hear how Al attacked that challenge on the FSN basement in a moment. At the Henry Ford in Greenfield Village, they play historic baseball by the rules of 1867. And this August, they'll be displaying the original trophy bat from the 1867 World Championship game. The FSN basement now continues with this special all-star edition. 53,559 people shoehorned into Tiger Stadium on July 13th of 1971 for Detroit's first all-star game in 20 seasons. The American League had not won in nine years, but in a game that featured an amazing array of eventual Hall of Famers, six of those Hall of Famers homered in the game. And the one we'll remember is the one by Reggie Jackson. There's a long drive. That one is going way up. It is off the roof. That hit the transformer up there. Mr. How about another paper? Hey, that'd be great. Ah, uh, yes, Jackson Homers, K-Line Stars, the American League won in July of 1971. Those of us who grew up in this town recalled K-Line's quiet class. He walked softly and carried that big stick. An all-star a staggering 18 times. To be honest, Al wasn't going to make anybody's all-interview team. That's why it was somewhat surprising that he found himself in a broadcast booth. After a legendary playing career, there was number six, wondering... What next? It was tough. Uh, I, I wasn't offered a job by the organization. Uh, I never asked for a job from the organization. Why not? Uh, I never asked for anything when I played. I mean, I always thought that if they wanted you, they'd asked you. And uh, they, never, they never offered me a coach's job, a minor league job, a scouting job, which was fine, you know. Uh, but I worried that because my whole life was baseball and what, is I, what am I going to do now uh, to, you know, make a living for my family, because, you know, I, the most I ever made was 103000 and uh, and I wanted to send both my kids to college, and, uh, but fortunately, uh, the station called me about doing the, the broadcast and working with uh, George Kell, which was a godsend, because I was back in baseball again. How tough was that for you to go on TV and, and talk? It was re it's really hard because, as you mentioned, I didn't, you know, I was always told by the players, watch what you say. You know, I always, I always kept quiet, didn't say very much. And then now, all of a sudden, I have to go on TV and start talking about the good things and maybe some bad things that happened. Once we started winning, it got to be a lot of fun. You know, I had to bite my tongue a lot because I got so upset with losing you know, as a player and then sitting up in the, in the booth and watching the team lose over and over again. And it was frustrating, and I really... And I, I could really tell, I had a hard time because the guys in the truck would say, come on now, you're getting down now, because I was, I was still a Tiger. And when you lose and lose badly, it affected me. And you, you can't let that happen, as you know, you can't let that happen while you're, you're up in the, in the booth because you're supposed to be not pulling for anybody really that much, but you're supposed to you know, be upbeat all the time. And I had a hard time doing that because I was still a Tiger, and I, I lived and died with them your venture into broadcasting good for Al Kaline the person because it forced you to be a little more out -y. oh yeah after the first first two years uh, uh, it really helped me a lot because you know I felt more comfortable with myself first of all because uh, you know I didn't uh, you know people made a, made a lot over me all the time and I always felt uncomfortable with that and even even when I was in my playing days when when the writers would ask me about myself I had a hard time answering. Now, if you wanted to talk about somebody else or the game, then I could, I could just ramble on. But they wanted to talk to me about myself, and you know, I got, maybe got f three hits or four hits, and, you know, and, and it was a hard, hard th uh, thing for me to do. But uh, working with uh, George Kell, and of course I worked with some, you know, George is the greatest man that I've ever been around. He, he, he's just a great, great guy, and I think he enjoyed it. I know I enjoyed it. Ah, we offer to them a hearty huzzah. We thank the Greenfield Village players. 
They're putting baseball in some historical perspective for us every weekend afternoon during the summer months on these terrific grounds. The Henry Ford and Greenfield Village are truly Detroit's treasures, as are our baseball heroes, two of whom we have profiled for you here. You will not meet classier gentlemen. As a kid growing up in Detroit, we all wanted to be like Kaline, who could do it all and did. As we grew older, we wanted to sound like Cal and never could. They're part of the reason why baseball is so important to us. We hope you've enjoyed this special edition of the FSN Basement. I'm John Keating, and now with these two final words, play ball. We vow to keep the memories and emotions of all-stars past and future forever.